Well, right now we're in for a great treat. Uh, this is a very beautiful meditation. And we're asking for a special unction of the Holy Ghost to allow us to experience the fullness of the intent of this meditation. And this meditation will be called the Temporal King, which is a very important meditation uh, of St. Ignatius Loyola. So it's kind of like we're phasing away from the first week of the spiritual exercises, and we're about to enter into the second week. But before we enter into the second week, or the second stage of the spiritual exercises, we need to um, place the carrot before our nose, so to speak, just like we do to the donkey, right, to get the donkey moving around, uh, something that will attract us. There needs to be a thrust. And this is going to be uh, the moment that we're, we're lanced out, we're thrown out into the deep uh, by attraction, by love. And so we contemplate the King, Christ the King. And, but we contemplate His beauty, the attraction of His personality. And then, of course, we're going to ask for the fruit which will be to allow us to follow Christ always, to fall in love with His mission and to follow Him, to become imbued with that apostolic spirit. The context of this meditation, uh, we have to kind of put ourselves back into the 16th century in Spain. As you know, back in those days, this was the, the years of the knights in shining armor. This is the period of time where Christendom uh, had a lot of chivalry. And it was still alive in very many parts of Europe, especially in Spain, as they were in constant warfare against the, the Moors, trying to push out the Moors out of the country. And so there was a lot of militaristic spirit, a lot of idealism, a lot of, uh, and, and a lot of reality uh, of, of warfare and, 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 and knighthood. And as we know, St. Ignatius himself, before his conversion, uh, he was a soldier. And he was in the inner parts of the king uh, in Spain, or in, in the authorities of Spain. And so in part of that, that being part of the court... Um, uh, he had one episode after his um, injury when he was out in battle and had his leg shot up. Um, he had a big bone sticking out of his um, out of his leg, like out of the skin of his leg, and he was so full of chivalry, and this was a lot of self honor and sense <laughs> and his own vanity uh, that he decided because he would not be able to dance uh, in perfect fit, uh, in, you know, the bone sticking out of his boot. And so he had to saw off the bone. You know? So he actually had a saw and, and just bit down on some sticks and had them saw off uh, the ugly part that was sticking out of his leg, <laughs> you know, so that he could rejoin the, uh, uh, the, the, the royal courts, right? And so he, this guy, this man was tough as nails, and uh, he would do anything uh, to promote his what he thought was correct and right. And he was a very tough man, uh, a very masculine figure. And um, and so when he's giving us this meditation, you have to kind of go back into his world, you know. Um, and, and not just nostalgically going back and saying, wow, this is, yeah, we have to fight for a king and we have to be standing in honor and so forth. But a real king, a real spiritual king that fits exactly what he's talking about and that is worthwhile of giving everything to follow him, doesn't matter how modern we get. Just the fact that we have four people in this room right now talking about... Uh, 
a Jesus of Nazareth from 2,000 years ago shows the force that, that has reverberated even to this day that four of us can come together and talk about him. You know, it's that force. That's what we want to get to. We want to tap into that force, that power, that attraction that, that has uh, attracted all men to himself from James St. John's Gospel. When I am raised from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And this is when we want to tap into that, uh, that, that attraction. Uh, what is it that makes many of these men just pick up and leave everything? Putting everything aside because of this king who says something. You know, What is he saying? Who is saying it? Who is he? Could I know him? Could I follow him? Would he consider me worthy to follow after him and with him? These are the questions that we will ask in this meditation that we will contemplate and hopefully the Holy Ghost will inspire us with his grace so that we too can become his followers. And we find these in the paragraphs uh, 92, 93, 94 of the Spiritual Exercises Manual of St. Ignatius I don't think I have this in, the, in uh, uh, the little binders that I gave you all. So I'll just read straight from the manual. This will be to place before my mind a human king. So in other words, he wants to take us back to the chivalrous uh, things, the way people saw it back in those days. right? He wants to see the king and all his regalia. A human king chosen by God our Lord Himself, to whom all Christian princes and people pay homage and obedience. And this will be to consider the address of this king. So the king is giving a speech. And it's like we're in like awestruck. The way he's saying things. The way he's communicating. The way he's, his persona is, is convincing us, Right? So it says, this will be to consider the address this king makes to all his subjects with the words, it is my will to conquer all the lands of the infidel. This king wants to conquer the world. He wants to, to spread this kingdom of love and true justice and holy faith that will save all men. And, and he's so convinced about this, this, this king that's given the speech. And therefore, whoever wishes to join with me in this enterprise, underline that word enterprise, it's going to be a very important word, enterprise. Whoever wishes to join with me in this enterprise must be content with the same food, drink, and clothing, etc. as mine. So too, he must work with me by day and watch with me by night, etc. That is, he has had a share in the toil with me afterwards, he may share the victory with me. And paragraph number 94, Consider what the answer of good subjects ought to be to a king so generous and so noble-minded. And consequently, if anyone would refuse the invitation of such a king, how justly he would deserve to be condemned by the whole world and looked upon as an ignoble knight. Yes, brother, this is, <laughs> this is, this is the forbidden way of saying things nowadays. So enjoy it. But you have to, get, you have to ask for that grace to tap into this 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 enthusiasm that's going through the crowd huh? when he's in his plaza. Huh? Almost like a... Remember back in the olden days, well, we weren't there, right? But how they used to carry the supreme Roman pontiff in his gestatoria. Huh? And, and, and the whole world applauding the, 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 uh, the king of Christendom. Huh? He was the representative of Christ. And all governments recognized that. You know, just a just hundred years ago, you know, <laughs> And, and, and goodness, it's all gone now. But, but, but St. Ignatius is trying to bring us back to that moment. Imagine you there. And you're seeing this Christ. 
that is so energetic, he's enthusiastic, he's already had some victories. And, and, and it's not just, it doesn't exhaust itself in just mere human endeavors. I mean, we're talking about, we're mingling in it with the divine. This is, this is the moment of truth. This is the moment of truth. So for in order to us to kind of delve into this, and I would like to use the Word of God because I wouldn't just want to remain in this type of a, a meditation. It's, it's always good to go to the Word of God so that God can work on us with grace. But I'm going to present a gospel to you that actually has all these elements in it that we just spoke about, that St. Ignatius is trying to convey. And that is the miraculous catch Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Let us kind of go through this uh, passage of the gospel. And let us, like St. Ignatius, uh, have this in mind, this, this chivalrous understanding of, of the moment, huh? uh, to, to, to pick up on the enthusiasm, to be part of it, to, to want to sign our name. That's kind of the fruit of this meditation would be to sign our name on a dotted line, you know, to a check that has a blank check on it. We don't know. We don't know what it's going to cost. We don't know what it's going to tell. We just trust that it's going to be all good. It's going to be so good. It's going to be saving souls left and right. It's going to be conquering the world and parts of the world for Christ. So imagine a beautiful morning huh? in, these, in the beautiful area in the north part of the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, the air is kind of fresh, like a day like today, like we had today. And if, you know, here we are in late August and it's in, a, in the nice 50s early in the morning this morning. Uh, kind of a, a cool, crisp air. And there's a crooked to teeth... Uh, stinky, uh, uneducated, kind of rude man on the beach cleaning his nets. You know, just, and he looks very disturbed. You know, he's kind of, he has all these nets and he's trying to let, clean the nets. Trying to clean his heart, right? It's a good symbol that he's trying to clean, purify himself. And then, all of a sudden, out of the corner of his eye, he kind of, and then he looks up, and there is this man that he's been hearing about and been in contact with, but doesn't know too much about, this Jesus of Nazareth, this, this prophet man. And he sees them walking, and as he's walking toward him, but with a, a, almost a vast crowd from the village, everyone's gathering around. You know, just, just picture that, this, that sight, to turn there and see the energy of Jesus, the youthfulness of his faith, almost an angelic countenance, huh? has so many messages to, to, to communicate to those who would be asking, who would seek a Christ who's in charge of himself. He's not... He's not burnt out with, with complications and worries. And he is full of life. And he is the second person of the most holy trinity through whom all things were made, were created. And he, God, man, and his whole humanity is in display, attracting the crowds. Why is it all these walks of life are surrounding him, peering in to see what he has to say, what he, what he looks like, what is behind this character, this no, most noble character. Now, people, a lot of people are just seeing him as a human being. The Pharisees just saw him as one more human being. Nothing really distinguished him from many other people. But for those who do have a sense of humanity, they can sense something about his his words, his authority. Remember that, that phrase in the gospel? 
that he spoke to them with authority, unlike the Pharisees. That was a novelty, but a welcomed novelty. He, he had someone that could put people at ease with the truth. He was not looking for the applauses of men. He was saying the things the way they are, the way they truly help people in their own minds and their own hearts. And so all walks of life, uh, you know, uh, 40-year-old homeschool mothers are there, you know. <laughs> you got uh, the soccer moms are, you know, funneling in there, the fat ones, the skinny ones, uh, the old ones, the young ones, the girls, and the boys. And we have, uh, you know, jockeys there. Uh, we have independent-minded men. We have scrupulous men there. We have... Uh, uh, burnt out men there we have those who are happy with life and ready to take on the whole world we have others who have withdrawn from the world and they're all walking alongside jesus because he has something magnetic about his person attracting all the personalities and, and so be with peter just sit down with peter and watch that as he comes forward he's coming forward and then this prophet comes over and he sees Peter and he asks Peter for a favor. Could I use thy boat? And Peter's like amazed by all of this people gathering. He doesn't want to cause a scene by this people. So he says, sure, why not? And so they get into the boat put everything back in the boat and they, and they drift off the, uh, the shoreline a bit, probably about 10, 15 feet at most, probably less. And because there were so many people pressing, he had to get this, he had to get a pulpit. He had to get a sort of a get me out of the way where I don't get crushed. And he called for the attention of the people. And in another gospel we see, we don't see it in this gospel in particular, but the parallel gospel of St. Uh, Matthew, I believe, um, the theme of that speech is about the the parable of the of the sower, the parable of um, the the word, the seed being planted or being put on the ground or being put in the thistles and the thorns, and so the word of God is is going into many different types of hearts, right? Uh, superficial hearts, worldly hearts ambitious hearts or fertile hearts, open, humble hearts. And so Christ is giving this amazing speech and the people are, the jaws are like dropping, even have the kids like paying attention. Could you imagine? Well, they didn't have all those distractions of uh, Nickelodeon and all that other baloney to, to distract. So they, you know, they, they, they gl they're glued to this character out there in the boat. Even the kids, well, just look at it. People are like, like really, like, you know, squinting their eyes and, and bowing their heads and agreeing with the things that is making it's making sense. And and believe it or not, Peter is semi listening to this. Of all people there present, the one who does not want to be there is sort of semi listening. And so Christ, is, he has a, such an urgency, but a, but a softness. He has a sort of a, a threatening, yet inviting tone. Remember when Jesus went into the temple, he cleared out the temple twice in St. John's Gospel, I believe, right? Two, two, two separate occasions, he went with whips and knocked over things. And, and the second time it happened, note very well, that after he did that, all the weaklings came to him and listened to him. All those who were maimed, weak-hearted, losers in life, and they were the ones, after he had just had wrath poured out upon everybody there, <laughs> these people came to him. They knew. They understood the perfect balance. It's just all divine. His personality 
true man, true God. And, and they flock to him. Those who are, who are of the light, those who are possible candidates of the light, hear his voice. They come, they know him. They heed his voice and they follow him. He's the good shepherd. What a tremendous image. A true shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. And that gives us extraordinary, extraordinary communication. He looks over to Peter. And he says, cash your nets out for a catch in the deep. Duke in alto. And this is where Peter lost it. What? We were hard at this all night long. <laughs> now he kind of got frustrated. You know, poor Peter. He had all his personal paraphernalia. He had all of his own resources. Just like that knight who wants to go and fight for himself. So much paraphernalia the whole night long just catching Twinkie wrappers and old uh, sun-kissed tuna fish cans, rusty. I mean, he knew this lake like the back of his hand. He, he, his father used to bring him out there in perpetuum, you know, constantly out there. He knew every little channel of all the fish. And he's like, he's like scratching his head. He's like, why couldn't we, why couldn't we catch anything? We just, what a waste of time. I just want to go and have my kosher bacon and eggs. Get me out of here. So you can see all of this is playing out in Peter's heart. You know, he wants he say, don't ask me this. Are you nuts? Where so many other young men would have, would have liked to have been there. That was like the possibility. So many could have been called. You know? So many could have been called. And yet, Peter is asking this beat up, I'm, I'm sorry, Jesus is asking this beat up, washed up, failed, uh, middle aged, uh, uh, has his wife and, and, and has all of everything all defined already. And Jesus is asking him for service. Remember the rich young man. And Jesus looked at him, St. Mark's Gospel says, He looked at him with love, right? He looked, he looked into him with love. And the young man just went away, walked away, because he, he had so many possessions, so many inordinate attachments, too much baggage. And Christ was still asking him, and then he just walked away. We don't know anything else about him. Scripture's lost track of him. What a mystery of the call, right? Who, who Christ is calling? Because you remember also in St. Mark's Gospel, we have the whole episode of um, Genezaret, remember? When we have the, the man who is living among the tombs and he's possessed by the demons by legion and they bind him and he breaks all his his chains on a daily basis and when Jesus came and he asked him who are you and this I'm legion and this that and the other and leave him and then go into the swine and the swine goes into the into the off into the cliff into the into the sea and then the man says May I come with you? And the scripture says, Jesus, listen to this, admitted him not. That man could have took the place of the rich young man. What's the big deal? But the scriptures was very adamant. He admitted him not. He says, go rather to thy house and among thy friends. He didn't say go take a wife. He just says go to thy house and among thy friends and tell them of the great mercy that God has shown you. 
And the scripture says that he went all around the Decapolis. It was just as one man show, you know. But that's what God, that's what Jesus asked him to do. So not all are called. Or as the scripture says, many are called and few are chosen. Another part of gospel. And so Jesus is looking at Peter. And Peter is like dismayed. But he sees the crowds and he sees this man of persuasion. And he says, we have been hard at it all night. But here's the key. In thy name, we shall put out our nets for the catch. In thy name. In nomine tuo. In thy name. Peter had to rough it up. Here they were, like the first crusaders on that boat. They were paddling out there ardently, going out into the deep, going off, way off the shore. And because of that trust in Jesus, Jesus arranged all those fish, come hither. And all the fish came into the, right into the nets of Peter. And what an extraordinary scene. What an enthusiastic moment when they saw that miraculous catch. Oh, look, my goodness, we don't have to work for two months now. <laughs> now we can take a vacation. We can go out golfing and stuff. We hit the jackpot. But Peter was overwhelmed and was calling over to John's boat to come over, to the other diocese, to come over and help. Got so many fish here. You know, I think it's St. Jerome that said there was a hundred... This is going to the post-resurrection. Remember when, they, when, he, when there was another miraculous fish and they, they caught 153 fish after the resurrection. And St. Jerome says that the reason for that was because... That was how many types of fish they are in the world. Now, that's a very ancient way of looking at it. I'm sure it's probably a bunch of nonsense, right? <laughs> but, I mean, Jerome is saying it, so it means something spiritual now, right? In other words, symbol of how many types, types of species of fish there are. And so Christ caught every type of them, won them over to his cause, his burning cause that no man will be able to extinguish. Then our Lord said, I have a, I have a, um, a passion. What, what, what's those words? Um, I have a desire and a, of a baptism. How, how I wish this world were ablaze with fire. Christ. He wants to set the whole world afire and have a baptism to receive it. I am restless until it has occurred. Christ has this great sense of urgency and all those fish which symbolate, uh, uh, symbolize men and women of all stripes and colors of all cultures and of all times nothing can escape the omnipotent power of that net of Christ the nets of Christ and then Peter pushes all the men aside, you know, in his very dramatic form. <laughs> you know, and he throws himself on the, on the boat deck on his knees and he looks up to Christ and Jesus. And he looks into his noble eyes. Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And Jesus immediately bends down to him and says, Be not afraid. I will make you into a fisher of men. You will win over so many souls for me. Be not afraid. Now the greatest miracle of this was not the miraculous catch. Could you imagine having a miraculous catch? You have to clean all those fish. They'll be stinking up a storm. You'll have to get big old hefty 
garbage bags to try to uh, put all that in there and put an ammonia around it so that you can take out the stink that, and the garbage man won't come by for the next two and a half weeks. You know, it wasn't like the weekly thing we have now. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so could you imagine having that headache of fixing all that fish, all that work to be done? You can keep your miracle, <laughs> you know. I don't want your miracle. No, I would love it, you know. But, uh, but you know what the greatest miracle was that Peter trusted. That Peter made this act of faith, this boyhood faith. He didn't know what type of. He, he hardly knew the man, hardly. And he just threw himself wholeheartedly he said yes and even the greatest miracle of this is that Christ showed him his great love and we know this because when they came on that shore he says okay Zebedee Inc okay cousin and you take this and they just left everything the, the scriptures was adamant to say he left everything aside He left the nets and the boat, the mother-in-law, the wife. They're all left aside. And so therefore, as we continue, as we continue this great meditation for tomorrow morning, I would really invite you to make this experience of Christ. Let Him touch thoroughly your hearts, brother. Don't hold anything back. Now is not the time to to kind of shrink away. Now is the time to let everything hang loose and let Christ, listen to these words, convince you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.